Okay. So starting today's class, uh, last class we had a bit of a hiccup while well, the net got disconnected. So we actually couldn't uh, completely finish the topic that I was going for, which was weightlessness. A small quick recap. Concept weightlessness actually is the scenario where a person does not experience the weight, does not sense the weight, does not feel the weight, but the weight does still exist. Important question, how do we sense the weight? We sense our weight, not from the weight itself. We do not actually sense the force by which art pulls upon us. Rather, we sense the force of reaction that whenever we apply that weight onto a surface, or onto a medium that may be air, that may be uh, some water, or maybe some solid solid object, for example, a chair, table, or a bed, or even our leg while we're standing on our feet. Uh, whenever we apply that force onto some physical object, we get a reaction force. The sense of that reaction force is actually perceived as the experience of weight within our body. So in any case, if we do not get uh, enough amount of reaction force that we're usually used to, then we are going to experience that our body weight has become less. Uh, numerically, it hasn't become less because W equals to mg still remains the same, but our sensation, our physical senses, are, is going to tell us that uh, we have now a bit of a less weight. And if in any case, this reaction force that we are experiencing somehow becomes zero, that is the point where we define that we experience weightlessness, that we sense weightlessness. That is. Uh, we are not experiencing any reaction force. So that can only happen whenever the available weight force, the gravitational pull of the earth is actually used to actually accelerate our bodies so that we do not apply any more force onto, the, uh, onto any surface. The uh, example that we brought about in our last class was for the case of lift, because it is actually within the lift that most of the weightlessness cases are explained, but can be extrapolated to many other scenarios as well. So the example that we went by looks somewhat like this. Uh, let's say this is a lift at the lowest floor. This is a lift on the topmost floor of, of a certain building. So when the lift is about to go up for the duration, it does the actual acceleration. Our body has to have a resultant force upwards for which we are gonna have a bigger amount of upward reaction minus the weight and that upward reaction is going to be uh, sensed by our body. So we are gonna feel heavier for the duration of the acceleration. And whenever the lift is gonna stop at the upper uppermost level, then the lift is gonna decelerate for a small duration. So when the lift is gonna decelerate, uh, let's say it under, if it undergoes the same amount of deceleration as it was accelerating upwards, in that case, the initial velocity was working upwards, which needs to become the final velocity to be zero. So acceleration has to work negative direction, which means acceleration has to work downwards. We already have a fixed amount of downward force available, which is called the weight. So if there is a person within, uh, the person has a fixed amount of downward force weight. So because we already have a weight force available, we cannot, we cannot actually vary that force because W goes to mg, m is the mass of the person, g is the acceleration due to gravity. None of these things are actually subject to change for within the uh, perspective that we have right now. That's why, uh, that's why the variable force is actually the reaction force. So when the lift is about to decelerate, what actually happens, the tension on this uh, uh, rope, which holds the lift altogether within the box and everything, that actually becomes slightly lower. So, so this tension becomes lower and that actually causes the resultant force expression in that case now becomes W minus T. And this is W minus T, I'm writing W minus T because W would be in this case the bigger force and T would be the smaller force. And the duration of the resultant force would be still working in the downward direction. At this point, the person would exert a smaller amount of force onto the ground because for the deceleration duration, the upward reaction force would be somewhat smaller than the weight. Uh, and this reaction force and the tension are usually always equal. So I can also replace this uh, value by W minus R as well. So that causes the person to experience a bit of a lightweight. The sense of weightlessness will become whenever the person exert no reaction for exert no force onto the uh, onto the base of the lift box, or he experiences zero reaction force. Which means that we can experience weightlessness when R becomes zero. If this thing happens, then the entire resultant force would be equals to weight. The person will be using all of their weight to do an actual acceleration 
and that way no part of their available force no part of their available weight force can be exerted on the uh, floor of the lift that would give us a sensation of weightlessness that can happen if the uh, rope somehow let's say the, the lift is at the top floor and it's about to go down let's say by some uh, hypothetical scenario the lift cable breaks so what's going to happen the whole entire lift and the entire person is going to start having free fall so what do we mean by free fall free fall means that a person is gonna something is falling under the effect of gravity and no air resistance is involved within this scenario for the sake of simplicity we are assuming that so whenever this lift is going to start to do free fall this is the person is within inside and he has a default force of w on his body so this is the default w force the person is experiencing that if the cable breaks off then the lift can free fall which means the entire lift box the person both is going to start going down using an actual acceleration of g 10 meter per second squared so at this point all of their available force is going to be used to actually accelerate them the resultant force is also the available force which means no part of this weight will be exerted on the surface as a action force because everything is going down you need to understand that the box is going downwards at the same acceleration the person is going down. So they're practically in touch with each, with each other, but they're not actually exerting any force onto each other. That's the case of free falling. Within this scenario, because the reaction force will become zero, because if I now try to write down the resultant force, the resultant force, which can be written as the uh, difference of reaction force minus W, which is the typical case. I'm using a modulus over here just to give a sense of the magnitude. So whenever the uh, reaction force becomes uh, zero, the resultant force itself is weight, which means W equals to mg and practically means acceleration equals to g. Bottom line, whenever the person is free falling under gravity, they are exerting no more force onto any material. So they don't have any reaction force available to perceive the effect of their weight. This is the scenario that we call weightlessness. That weight is there, but apparently we do not sense the presence of weight. So it's a pretty interesting concept and this is also this thing, this uh, idea of weightlessness or the variable sense of weight can be further explored in a lot of different cases. Uh, one of the simple other example that I can bring about is whenever a person actually takes a jump off a wall onto the ground. So let's try and consider that scenario. Let's say this is a ground. For the time being, I'm considering this to be solid ground. Let's say concrete floor. So no uh, loose soil or loose patches over here. Let's say this is a wall. Uh, brick wall and a person standing on top of the wall figure not drawn to scale so let's say the person is about to take a jump off the wall and as long as the person is standing on the floor w equals to r so the person is experiencing uh, some weight downwards due to gravitational force the floor of the the top top surface of the wall is giving him an equal amount of upward force so he now has an equilibrium of forces experiencing the weight and everything whatnot regular scenario the moment the person takes the jump off the wall, what happens? The person starts to fall through air. Now, considering that this is a very small height, let's say the height is the maybe, let's say, uh, approximately five meters. Five meters is also quite tall. It's about two story tall. But for a human being, falling through that height can be considered to be pretty uh, small. So I'm using this sign, which is a bit of a curved equals to sign, which actually represents that almost equal to or approximately equal to. Uh, this means that it can be a slightly variation from five. I mean, plus or minus a very small amount, but uh, it is nearly five meter. That's the expression for it. This is the approximation sign. So let's say the height is five meter. The person takes the jump off. So as long as the person is going to fall to atmosphere, they are not going to experience any reactive force. They're not going to experience any reaction force from the air resistance, considering air resistance to be negligible. So as long as the person falls from this surface onto the ground, maybe maybe the person is going to land, let's say over here, till the point his feet, till the point, I mean, till before the point, the person's feet touches the ground, the person is gonna experience weightlessness because no reaction force is experienced. The moment the person actually touches right over here, uh, just a second. I'm sorry. Uh, 
So the moment the person actually uh, comes around and hits the ground, he's gonna be decelerated to rest. Now this is the part that I would really like all of you to pay really close attention to. And if you need me to repeat something, need me to slow down, just say it so. Try to visualize how this whole thing is going to happen. In true scenario, the reaction force that the person is gonna apply, the, the, action, the force that the person is going to apply on the floor and subsequent equal and opposite reaction force that the ground is gonna apply on the person, will vary over time. So there is actually a bit of a curve that by how the reaction force, action and reaction force both actually changes in terms of magnitude with respect to time. But for the sake of, uh, sake of uh, convenience, let's assume that the uh, upward force that the person is going to experience for the deceleration is going to remain constant for the duration of the deceleration. We are doing that for the sake of simplicity. So what you need to understand when the person falls to this to this much height <coughs> uh part of their gp converts into k so they falls under gravity so they experience some amount of downward velocity at the point of their uh colliding with the ground let's say at the end of their falling free falling with when the person's feet is touching the ground their downward initial velocity uh is i'm using the word initial velocity because this is the final velocity of the fall which is the initial velocity for the deceleration so try to think about in segments. So uh, we're taking the fall as one free falling segment till the power person moves through air. And then as the person's feet touches the ground, we are starting our next set of observation because that's when the acceleration becomes changed. So within this part, the acceleration had a constant value of A equals to 10 meter per second squared working downwards. The moment the person makes contact with the ground, acceleration is gonna be changed from here. So we are considering these two different acceleration cases as two different uh, sections of the of the motion they're actually perfectly one after another they're consecutive sections but because the acceleration is different we have to uh, consider them differently because you should remember that the four equations of motion that we have seen earlier v equals to u plus a t and uh, s equals to u2 sorry s equals to u plus v divided by 2 multiplied by t and then s equals to u t plus half a t square and then v square equals to u square plus twice s these four equations are all applicable for uh, constant acceleration scenarios. Did you actually see those equations? Uh, did I uh, go through these equations with you, kids? Yes or no? No, sir. No, sir. I didn't yet. I said, yes, sir. Then I, I'm, I'm going to talk about these uh, equations in today's class. Uh, one interesting factor is that uh, uh, CA people consider that you kids do not, should not require to uh, know these equations as exclusive equations of motion. Rather, you should be able to uh, form up equations uh, from the given question naturally from by, by basically utilizing the definition of the quantities that you are going to learn across. Uh, that's what their expectation, uh, but I personally feel that knowing these equations exclusively actually helps a lot to solve mathematical problems. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about these four equations of motion in today's class as well, since we did not cover this earlier. So that's going to happen. Uh, no worries. So the one of the key point for all of these four equations of motions to be applicable is that we have to consider these four equations for a constant acceleration case. So all of this time that you can see over in these equations, time is not available over here in this equation, but for the duration of motion that you are considering these equations to be applicable, if you want to apply them, for that segment of motion, acceleration has to be constant, which means acceleration needs to have a fixed value, acceleration needs to have a fixed direction for that much duration. If acceleration goes change, then you need to consider them as two different set of segment of motion so that you do not mess up the equation application. So one constraint or one precondition or one, uh, what can I say, money, uh, one required factor for these equations to be applicable in any given scenario is that for that duration, acceleration has to be constant. Only then we can apply this equation. I'm gonna talk about this equation a bit later, no worries. So the final velocity after the falling is, let's say, should be the initial velocity of the deceleration with the ground because the person is gonna contact with the ground and become to rest. So let's say the initial velocity of the deceleration duration I can actually find out this number. This should be uh, 10 square divided by 20 five meter per second. Yep. No. Is it? V equals to 
zero square plus two. So two into ten into five. Ten tens are hundred. Root over hundred ten. Now this is going to be ten meter per second. Ah, sir. Uh, I think I'm correct. If I'm correct, am I correct? Ah, anyway, consider that the final velocity of the fall is ten meter per second, which means that uh, initial velocity of the deceleration will be ten meter per second. From this initial downward velocity of ten meter per second, under the effect of deceleration, while the person is in contact with the ground, we want to bring this thing down to final velocity zero. This is what's going to happen for the deceleration case. So for this thing to happen, obviously you do understand that if we want to decelerate the object, the acceleration has to work in the upward direction, opposite to the initial velocity, so that the final velocity can be zero. This is an important bit. And why would this acceleration come? This would come from an accelerated resultant force, which should also work upwards. When the person is going to hit the ground, we're going to have two forces working on his body. He's going to hit the ground, so ground is going to hit him back by Newton's third law. So we're going to have a part of reaction force on his body, and the default force of weight is going to be on his body as well. If we want to have a resultant force in the upward direction, essentially the reaction force has to be bigger and the weight has to be smaller because in this case, the reaction force is working upwards and the weight is working downwards. For the resultant force to work upwards, the upward force obviously has to be bigger. That's the basic idea. So I'm gonna write, I'm at as well right over here that R bigger than W for the deceleration case. And that basically gives you the value of the deceleration. So what you need to understand that, where did this reaction force came from? come from? Where did this reaction force come from? What is the what is the source of this reaction force? The reaction force that the person is experiencing off the ground, O double F, off the ground, is because of the action force by which he is pushing on the ground. That's Newton's third law. I mean, his feet applies a force on the ground downwards, and then the ground gives him an equal and opposite force in the upward direction. So I'm trying to work this math out conceptually in the reverse order. So I'm starting in the final situation, slowly bringing up my logic backwards. I'm saying, uh, I'm gonna explain why I'm saying that. It's because that I am trying, what I want you to visualize or what the way I'm trying to visualize this scenario is that the person has to stop. So he has an initial downward velocity and the person is, should be stopping, which means he should have an, a bit of an upward acceleration, which is in this case is the deceleration. So upward acceleration means the resultant force for the deceleration period should work in the upward direction, which means the person's weight and the reaction force of the ground, they should working upward uh, against each other because they're in opposite direction, which means the reaction force in the upward direction must be bigger than the weight. Okay, where does the person gets the reaction force from? He gets the reaction force by using Newton's third law. So whenever the person exerted a downward force on the ground, the ground gave him an equal of equal and amount equal and opposite amount of upward force now because the reaction force in this case is definitely bigger than the weight obviously which means the person also press the ground with a force bigger than his own weight i'll say this again because if this is the reaction force that is exerting exerted on the person from the ground but in the third law the person definitely applied this amount of force on the ground as well. Now you have to understand that these two forces are not to be considered as a resultant because these are Newton's third law pairs. They are working on different bodies. Person is achieving our reaction force upward, which essentially mean that person exerted our action force downwards. That's obviously true because of Newton's third law. So the, way, the only way the person can receive an upward R force is if the person also exerts a downward R force on the ground. Which brings us to the idea that whenever the person is decelerating, the person should definitely come uh, apply a force, definitely bigger force than the weight on the ground. I'll say this again. If the person is decelerating while taking the jump and then eventually decelerating on the ground, the person definitely pushes the ground with a force that has a magnitude bigger than the weight. The duration of the, fo duration of the force that the person pushes on the ground is downwards and the duration of the force that the ground pushes the person back is upwards. So person experiences two forces, the reaction force in the upward direction, the weight force in the downward direction. We have to calculate the resultant, on the, of the, uh, resultant force on the person using these two forces, the reaction force and the weight, which are working on the same body, in this case, the person, which ultimately can lead up to the calculation of deceleration scenario.
So that's the bit that we need to consider. Sir, could you explain it again? Like the forces acting on the person. Person experiences these two forces. One is reaction force from the ground. Another one is the weight due to the gravitational pull of earth. Uh, weight is happening due to gravitational force, which is basically generally understandable. Every massive object uh, applies a pull on another massive object. Massive in this case doesn't mean big. Massive in this case, I'm meaning that uh, anything that has mass is considered to be a massive object. So that's one thing. And the point that I was highlighting more about that, why did this reaction force come from? I mean, why do we have a reaction force in the first place? Why do we have that? This reaction force is coming from Newton's third law. Is that we can only have a reaction force whenever we have the pre-existing of a re an action force. So the reason I said that I'm going it backwards is because person can only achieve a certain reaction force if he applied that equal amount of force on a different body. So in this case, for this reaction force to be available on the person's body, person had to push the ground with equal amount of force downwards. So the ground is experiencing, ground is experiencing, get this word very, very clearly. Ground is experiencing our force downwards from the person. But in the third law, ground is applying our force upwards on the person. So person in Rupert Katskara force to char. Additional to the reaction force, person report additional cascara force to hoche W. O do the mila on the result and calculate court to have it. This R does not belong to person. This R belongs to ground, which is the action force. This R belongs to the person, which is the reaction force. Make sense? Yes, sir. Bucha gas again. Clear who say? Yes, sir. Any further question? different different example about the case of weightlessness. One of the simple other examples that I can bring about for the case of a very common scenario of weightlessness that you might come across in different uh, videos or also in different discussion is that in satellites, uh, satellites in uh, what I mean is that uh, satellites which go around the uh, around orbit around the Earth, for example, International Space Station. Uh, do you guys know what International Space Station is? I'll just try to make sense. This is stuff, basic stuff that you should know, but it's not a big deal. It's not a crime. If you don't know yet, here's what you learn. International, actually I can write the short from ISS. This is the International Space Station. International Space Station is actually a satellite, man-made satellite, which was put on the, in a, orbit around the earth, which is going to go around the earth very fast. And uh, it will allow people to be up there. It has habitable space within. It has a, and it's basically like a floating home, which is an uh, orbiting satellite around the earth. It is much far, hard, higher above the atmosphere. So it goes around the uh, earth pretty fast, like super fast. Uh, but, and it's, uh, satellite which means it's not getting lost from the earth our earth's gravity is pulling it down then again uh, by some physics it is not falling towards the earth either so earth's gravitational pull is not pulling it down so you might wonder that why earth is not pulling it down i mean what's happening earth has gravitational force so why shouldn't it pull it down that's the part that i'm going to explain it to you ISIS actually currently uh quite large but it actually started Uh, so this is the current full view of the ISS. We have like four, four, uh, 16 long solar panels. We have a lot of modules over here and we have multiple other uh, solar panels over here in a, in a 90 degree direction because whenever it goes across the sun's direction, so these things don't receive that much uh, solar energy. They're actually placed in optimized fixed position. And if, and if you should see it, let's try to find out a bit of a uh, HD image maybe large so i said large 
Does this enlarge? Yeah, this is an enlarger. Okay, so uh, the part that you can see over here for international space is actually it's actually quite large. Um, this whole thing is in the space. Um, you can only experience whether an object is large or not depending upon if you have a referenced object beside it. So we don't have any reference object beside it, but it's actually quite big. Uh, all the all the small cylindrical parts that you see over here are small bit of modules which went up to the space by the Soyuz rockets and and other uh, uh, and also the uh, what is this thing called the reusable American flight that they discontinued afterwards. I actually for, forgot the name. Uh, many different uh, U.S. missions and and, and Russian missions uh, actually was used to bring up all the individual parts. Uh, part by part, it was not built up in a single day. So let's say they first set up this one of the small medium component, then they bring up, uh, then they brought up another cylinder, then they brought up another the cylinder and they slowly joined all of these parts together to make up this whole be huge thing. And different parts have different uh, uh, type of crews over here. We have a bit of a Russian part, we have a bit of an American part. Uh, and then we have a bit of a, uh, I think European uh, part as well. So there. So different segments over for different parts, uh, different nation try to develop their individual part. But this is actually a, a colony of all the people living within the same uh, area used for many uh, international, uh, many uh, satellite or, or uh, extraterrestrial researchers. So this is the International Space Station. Now, why am I talking to you about International Space Station? One of the, uh, one of the things that happened is within the International Space Station, uh, or within any uh, free floating satellite, people experience weightlessness. So let me just show you a bit of an example that why is that happening? Or maybe how is that happening? That might be actually a good idea to, to put it. Um, let video. Uh, so it's inside. Okay, uh, let's just see one of these YouTube videos. Might as well get a object like. Hello. So this is Nick Williams. I'm up here on the International Space Station. So she's on the so this is no two. This is a really cool module. Um, of course, most of these modules you see they see have four sides, practically floating, uh, and they're put together. That way, we could sort of walk, work on a flat plane, either a wall, a floor, another wall, or the ceiling. But you know, again, all you have to do is turn yourself, and your reference changes. The reason I'm bringing that up is because this is where four out of six of us sleep. And so people always ask about sleeping in space. Do you lie down? Are you in a bed? Um, not really, because it doesn't matter. You don't really have the sensation of lying down. You exactly. You don't have the sensation of lying down. That's the important bit. That's the nice bit that I'm trying to get at. That you don't have the sensation of lying down because it is free force situation in all directions. Uh, we These people apparently don't sense their weight uh, in the International Space Station. And why is that? That's pre pretty much... What I'm trying to get at. So this is why this is how it happens. Pretty interesting. It's very basic physics, but it it's mighty physics. It's it, it works. It, it it's beautiful. So let's say this is the Earth. Figure not drawn to scale. And let's say uh, this is the uh, orbital duration of International Space Station. So currently, I'm trying to show this in a bit of an ellipse to give you a bit of an idea that it's going around in a circle. So if I just try to draw the full circular view, maybe let's say this is Earth. Uh, actually, let's say this is art, uh, and let's consider that this is the actual. Okay, I was wanting the whiteboard to make it a circle. So, so let's say this is the orbit of the International Space Station. So, how does this work? Let me put it this way. Listen, this is International Space Station right over here. If we made the International Space Station stationary right over here, the pull of Earth's gravitation force, which is W, will definitely pull it down. This thing is going to definitely go down. But it actually doesn't. 
And the reason it doesn't is that it is set by a bunch of rockets and bunch of calculation to go around in a fixed circular orbit around the earth. Actually, the orbit is not fixed. Uh, the radius of the orbit is actually fixed. So how far is it going to travel from the Earth's, radio, uh, Earth's center? Uh, that is fixed. And how fast is it going to go? That is actually defined by means of a lot of rockets and a lot of calculations. So let's say we have put down a speed on this, on, on this uh, thing. So what is going to actually happen? This is the part that I need you to understand. The velocity over here is tangent to the circle. And the applied force that the satellite experiences towards the Earth is working in towards the center of the circle. So it means that these two things are always in 90 degree to each other. If you explain, if you want to put the ISS over here, it's the same thing. Weight is working towards the center of the circle, whereas velocity is working tangent with the circle. That's the key idea for circular motion. In circular motion, the instantaneous velocity of an object is tangent with the circle. Whereas the, uh, the direction of the velocity, direction of the force is always towards the center. So why is it that the person, uh, do not experience weight or why is it that the ISS does not fall towards the center of the earth? There is a reason for this. The idea is that what I need you to observe, let's say the ISS is traveling from this position to this position over a certain amount of time T. So let's say this is our position A, this is our position B maybe. So I'm going to label this velocity as VA and label this velocity as VB. So I'm using this as now as vector signs to represent them as vectors. So within this time t, it actually covered a circular arc of this much from A to B, this IB arc length was covered. And it actually underwent a significant amount of velocity change. Delta V vector in this case can be given by final vector minus initial vector. Now, what is really important for you to understand, the magnitude of these two vectors, V and VB, are exactly the same. Because we have set this uh, satellite at a fixed speed to orbit around the Earth. But the direction of these two velocities are definitely not same. Mark my words. The direction of these two velocities are definitely not same because it has underwent a significant amount of change. And that's pretty much, pretty much where the delta V cannot be zero. If you try to find out the magnitude of this thing, if you're trying to find the actual value, or, I mean, magnitude and duration both of this thing, we might as well use a vector geometry. We are going to try to find this out using a vector triangle. Now, important information before I go for this one. I have discussed with you kids, how does a triangle rule and a parallelogram rule work? And for both of these cases, the key idea was like this. If you want to find out the result of two vectors of X plus Y, you can go for her and for find that, find that out by doing that. I'm gonna use that same exact procedure, but only the problem is that in this case, we have a bit of a minus. So how can we find out the vector subtraction of using triangle rule? It's very simple, have a look. I'm gonna rewrite this equation in this format, VB, plus minus VA. So what I'm trying to show you, I am going to add the negative VA vector with DB. So what is negative VA vector? Let me extrapolate that first. If you have a vector, let's say VA vector is working this way. Uh, let's say this much length. If this is your VA vector, if you keep the same length, same orientation, which means in the same direction, but just flip the direction, just reverse the direction, that is basically what is going to be minus VA. So if I draw an equal length arrow, which is parallel to the original arrow, meaning their alignments are same, but the direction are perfectly opposite, this is actually minus VA. That's how we get a negative vector of a certain given vector. So what I'm trying to do over here, I'm actually trying to add up VB with minus VA. So in this case, you can see within this, within this figure, uh, v and VA is going upwards, VB is going down uh, towards upward left. So uh, let me just uh, drop these vectors a little bit uh, for the sake of convenience. Let's say this is the VB vector that we're going to draw. And VA vector in this case was shown given upwards. Uh, both of their lengths should be exactly equal. So disregard my uh, hand drawing. So if VA is going upwards, minus VA should be working downwards. So that's the way it works. So what we want to do right now, we want to find out the resultant sum of this one and this one. We want to add up these two by triangle rule or parallelogram rule whatsoever. So if I go for a uh, parallelogram rule, uh, might as well be a good idea. So let's say this is our VB. And VA should be starting from the same position because we are doing parallelogram rule. So minus VA is going this way of equal length. So this is our minus VA. Now, if we complete the parallelogram and find out the diagonal of this triangle, of this, of this parallelogram, 
that's going to be basically our resultant force. So this is our resultant, which in this case is equal to delta V. So delta V does have a magnitude and direction. And what if we can see that this is working towards downward left. And that should be the average direction of the acceleration of this object towards downwards left. Because like I said, that the force is working towards the center. The pull of the earth in this case is causing the object to go around the circle. And the way it is perfectly managed is this amount of velocity that we're going to have that happened over a duration of time t. Let's say this is going to cause an acceleration of del v over t. And we can actually set a number onto this. It's all about that how much magnitude of velocity change that happened. We can find it out by the vector vector triangle or vector parallelogram. And we can actually get a number over here. All that it remains is to make sure that all of this acceleration that we're going to require to change the direction of the of the, change the direction of the satellite should be provided from gravitational acceleration. So let's say uh, the way the scientists actually figured this out and the, the way they set out the radius of this orbit and the speed of the orbit in such a way that the acceleration of this particle over here uh, at this point is equal to the g value right over here. Now, that g value is not 10. If I say 10 a bit earlier, I forgot. Uh, I, I was wrong because the value of g equals to 10 is on the surface of Earth. You have to understand that. Now we are really far away from that. So the value of g would be significantly smaller. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, not going to show the mathematics regarding this thing. That's a bit far-fetched for your level. But g would be definitely smaller because we have moved far, significantly farther away from the surface of the Earth. So let's say the g value over at this location, at this distance from the center of the Earth, is let's say that is uh, uh, maybe 3 meter per second square. I'm just coming up with this number randomly. The way the scientists are going to set the acceleration such that that g, that ex, uh, resultant acceleration is, acceleration is also 3 meter per second square. Now, what is the benefit of this? I mean, what are we achieving by making the actual acceleration of the satellite exactly equal to the gravitational acceleration of that point? This is what is happening. Try to understand. The weight of the satellite at this point, which is given by mg, is also working as ma, which is practically the resultant force of the satellite, which means currently all the weight force that the satellite has available to itself because of the gravitational pull of the earth, it is using all of that force. That's the important word. It is using all of that force to make some effective acceleration of itself. Let's say you have 100 Newton force. Using a 100 Newton force, you are using, you are producing a three meter per second square acceleration on your body and no more weight is left no more force is left to the satellite by which you could it could possibly get closer to Earth. So all the, I mean, you have to understand that if the satellite has to get closer to Earth, it needs to have some force available for it to get closer to the Earth. It experiences a force towards the Earth, but that force is altogether used to maintain the circular motion, to maintain the circular motion. That basically ensures that the object is gonna keep going around the, around the Earth because of the pull of the gravity, but the pull of the gravity is not going to be able to pull it close to Earth because it is using all of its available forces exclusively to make circular motion, or we call it centripetal acceleration. That's the beauty of, uh, of this whole thing of idea of weightlessness. And because they're using all of their weight to use all of their acceleration, anything within the satellite, anything that is attached with the satellite, anything that is inside the satellite, they don't have no equipment, no human being, no amount of mass or water or whatever, they don't have any more weight left that they can actually exert on any surface. They have, they're using the, all of the things that is inside the International Space Station. They are all using all of their available weight to make go around the, sur around the Earth. So which means they don't have any more weight available to apply on, the, apply on, the, uh, on any surface. And so just basically the scenario that I just talked to you about that what's going to happen when the cable is going to be torn apart. Whenever the cable of the lift actually got torn apart, the person and the lift box, they are both falling towards the earth at the same acceleration of G, which means at this point, they're using all of their available weight to actually making some physical acceleration of their body. In this case, that acceleration was linear, but for this case, this acceleration is centripetal. So this is for a circular motion, whereas this, part, this person was actually falling directly towards the earth. 
uh, so if we use up all of our force for actual movement, we don't have any more force left to actually apply on a surface. That basically means that we are going to experience a experience perfect weightlessness. The British people are not going to experience weight. That's why the astronauts say that uh, do we lie on our back? Do we lie? Uh, where do we lie? That actually doesn't matter because they don't actually sense lying on their back or lying in their front because they don't actually experience any reaction force of any surface. They have a permanent floating situ situation. And this actually can lead up to a very, some very interesting uh, habit of uh, the astronauts. Um, because uh, okay, this is one of the examples of an astronaut. I mean, this one, this astronaut has had been within the International Space Station for a really long time and got habituated to that environment. And what you're going to see in this video that he is going to let go of a glass from his hand and look somewhere else and eventually going to try to find that out in the same location, like the way they do in the International Space Station. Nothing falls in the International Space Station because everything is floating. So this is actually pretty, pretty funny. So after the astronauts get back from the space station, it usually takes them a while to get adjusted to life on Earth. The launch on the Soyuz is amazing, quite a bit different from the shuttle. You know, the Soyuz is uh, a bit more like, you know, with the whole gravity thing. Sorry. So did you understand what just happened? <laughs> he just uh, let go of that glass, expected the glass to be there. He was looking for it, actually looking for it, because that's what his brain has been adapted to because for the long duration that this person has been within the International Space Station. So, but it was not there because now he is in on the Earth surface. Although his body is continuously feeding him that you're in Earth, but he is still not recuperated with the new uh, uh, or the or this new change. So he's struggling a little bit, which is pretty fun to watch. That that's what they are. That's how the International Space Station works. Okay, uh, I think I, I talked a lot, but does it make sense anyhow? If you have any question, I'll take it. That the whole uh, weight, weightlessness thing. If I want to put it in a very few sentences or very uh, very uh, what very very short amount. This is this. We can sense the weight or the pool of earth if we apply all of it or even part of that weight onto a surface, onto a material, onto an object, and receive a reaction force equal to the amount of force that we apply. If we apply all of our weight, we're gonna experience our weight as always. If we apply a smaller amount of weight, we're gonna feel slightly lighter. We're going to experience partial weightlessness, what happens in water. If we apply a bit bigger weight than what we're trying to do, we're going to feel heavier. For example, if we try to pick up, uh, if we try to pick up, let's say, 50 kg object over our head, we're going to feel heavy because we're going to apply a bigger amount of force on the ground. And if we apply no force of our weight on any physical surface, our body is not going to receive any reaction force of any surface. And that is the sensation we call weightlessness. That is the whole thing, uh, short form. Yes, Taisi, go ahead. Um, sir, does that mean that the pull of the earth is too small for the ISS to pull it towards the earth? Hello? Yeah, come again. Yes, sir. Does that mean that the pull of earth is too small to pull the ISS towards the earth? And it has enough weight to just stay on that place and orbit the Earth. Um, well, using the term too small actually uh, can be slightly misleading. What you are proposing is essentially correct, but I would say the wording needs to be slightly refined. Uh, this is what I mean. Earth is pulling on the ISS by its gravitational pull, and that's that. ISS is placed in such a location at such a speed that it is not falling close to the earth because it is using that weight force to continuously undergo circular motion. So the way I can put it is that our gravitational force on the ISS is there. The magnitude of this force, W goes to mg, g not definitely not equal to 10, is definitely there. But that pull 
is incapable of pulling the ISS towards the Earth because ISS is using that force not to get closer to the Earth, rather it is trying to get away from that. What you need to understand that having a direction that is tangent to the, the circle, you should see that this velocity is actually aimed outwards of the circle, which means this object has a natural tendency to fall off the circle. If you want to keep this object within the circle, you have to continuously pull it in, right? Yes, I mean, that's the whole gist, that's the whole concept of circular motion, that the object has to be continuously pulled in if I want to make it go into circles. That's precisely what IS is doing, that it is using all of its available gravitational pull weight to perfectly maneuver that action. So it is using all of that force to continuously go around in circles. Hence, it is no more, it is, hence it is not falling closer to the earth. In virtual sense, what you can think that it is actually always falling towards the earth, but just not enough to get any closer. Because the velocity is always undergoing change. It is always shifting towards that. Do you see that? I mean, this is the velocity, this velocity, and then this will be the velocity. Duration. The velocity is always curving towards the earth. So as if it is actually falling, but truly it is not falling. So, sir, does it mean that if the ISS stops moving, it will fall on the earth? Definitely. There is, there is no way any... Uh, actually stationary object can actually stay on uh, at top at top art i mean objects has to be moving uh, if they want to maintain a certain height from the earth and that maintaining that height actually means that whenever they are moving they are actually they actually should use earth's gravitational pull as effective force to maintain the acceleration i mean if the ISS moves a bit faster what's going to happen if the ISS moves a bit faster than what it is actually currently moving right now, it's going to slowly start to travel at a bigger arc and slowly get off the, uh, off the arc's gravitational field and eventually get lost in the space. If the ISS or, or orbits a bit slowly, then it's going to move slowly and but surely closer to Earth and eventually it's going to start colliding with the atmosphere and catch a fire and might burn into ashes before it reaches the Earth's surface or might actually fall on certain parts of the Earth broken into pieces. That speed that the ISS have to maintain at that height is very, very precise value. And within that machine, uh, within that ISS, actually different parts have different jet thrusters. And these are all controlled by an onboard uh, computer that it actually continuously monitors the relative speed with respect to the Earth's surface. And if it needs any correction, it automatically corrects it. But typically once you set it at a fixed value, unless there is a significant effect of solar flare or some uh, meteorite collision, it actually can maintain that velocity for let's say everlasting period. Make sense? Yes, sir. That's right. Ryan asked me a question uh, in, uh, in your chat. Is that is that uh, since astronauts can sense the feeling of lying down, can they sense the things they touch? The answer is yes. Touching a surface or grabbing on a surface or trying to push a certain surface with any part of your body, maybe feet, maybe knee, maybe elbow, maybe your hips, would mean that you are going to exert a force onto the surface, that surface is going to give you an equal amount of force back. For the duration, those two things are in contact. They are going to experience that force. So it means grappling on an object, they are going to sense that sensitivity. But they would not have the regular sensation of lying down like we have on Earth. I mean, as long as we are on Earth, no matter where you are located, no matter where you are located, uh, you or me or anyone else, will always sense a continuous pull of downwards. I mean, you are sensing it. If you, if you think in your head, I mean, you're sitting on a chair, you're lying on a bed, you are uh, standing up or whatever, you are sensing that something is pushing you up because you are pushing that down. So that sensation of lying down would not be there. But the sensation of touching things, I mean, the basic sensation of reaction force definitely will be there. Bucho. Beautiful. Any further question? Maybe not. Okay, uh, as I just uh, said earlier, we're gonna see, have a look at these uh, equations over here. I'm gonna go through the derivation process of this equation as well as I go forward with, the, with this uh, part of the discussion. You don't have to know the derivation. Uh, it's just okay, if, it's, it's only okay if you just remember this equation and how to use them. That's all that matters, but knowing how to knowing how to derive these equations can lead to a much deeper understanding for how this formula actually works. 
So that is a bit of a helpful in some cases. So let me just start over here. I'm going to try to accommodate this whole thing within one view. So this part that I'm about to start, which is the basic representation of derivation is not within a syllabus. And if you're not interested, you can choose not to pay much attention to this thing. Uh, you can choose to do that, but I highly recommend that you do pay attention. Uh, I personally feel this is really important for you to understand. So let's say we have an object which was, which had an initial velocity of u, and then uh, we applied some force on the object. And let's say, uh, we're going to apply a force on the object for the for a duration of time t, within which time the object travels from here to here, and it reaches a final velocity of v. And within this entire duration of period, we applied a force on the object that caused an uniform acceleration of a. I'm not showing that a over here because if I only draw it over here, this might actually give you the wrong representation that we are accelerating the object only at the beginning. I'm like a kick or something. No, that's not the case. We're pushing it all the way down like a, like a shopping cart or something. So that's the idea. So we're continuously pushing the object forward with a fixed amount of force. And that motion happened for a duration of time t. And let's say the distance between the initial position and the final position of the two things is s. So that's the these are the variables that we're going to handle for our upcoming discussion. So the first equation is very simple. Uh, we just go by the definition of acceleration. Acceleration is given by v minus u divided by t. So if we just cross multiply it, we are going to get at equals to v minus u, which ultimately gives you I should shift, uh, which ultimately gives you v equals to u plus at. So that's the equation number one. Important bit for you to understand from this equation is that is a possible uh, proportionality that we might have come might have. I'm going to talk about the proportionalities after I derive all the equations. The proportionalities can actually help you solve a lot of mathematical problems with a very e amount of ease. With, you can skip finding out a third variable in the process. So I'm going to talk about the proportionalities after a while. This is our first equation of motion. And the second equation is that the uh, definition of average velocity, the definition of average velocity, which I can write v average, is given by the numerical sum of initial velocity and final velocity divided by two, provided acceleration is constant. Now, if you wonder why is this applicable, I mean, why average velocity is equals to initial velocity and final velocity by two for a period of constant acceleration. Why this is true, I'm going to show it to you in a graphical way. Try to understand this thing. Let's say if I want to place this information that I have shown you on this figure in a graph of initial velocity, velocity versus time. Let's say uh, this is our graph of v axis, this is our t axis. So let's say at t equals to zero, uh, at, the, at initial time, the object had an initial velocity of this much. After the whole duration of traveling, let's say the object gets the final velocity, which is right up here. So let's say this is our final velocity. So this is our u, this is our t, which happens over a duration. Sorry, this is our v, final velocity. This is our speed axis. This is our time axis. So if I try to uh, complete the graph, this is how my graph is going to look. This is supposed to be a straight line because we are talking about in a uniform acceleration. 